Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, we wrapped up 1 Thessalonians the last time, and we are in 2 Thessalonians. It could not be a more opportune time for us to be in this book, considering what's going on all around us. And I want to talk to you today about the divine payday, the divine payday. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to read that in just a moment. Within just a few short months of his first letter, Paul was inspired to write a second time to one of his favorite churches. He personally was in Corinth at a new church plant that had many problems, and he was not able to go himself to see what was going on at Thessalonica. And as I shared last time in chapter 2 and 3 of 1 Thessalonians, he dispatched Timothy to go and to verify how they were doing. He came back with good news. And so within a few months, Uh, The apostle wrote them again under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote them to encourage them and to tell them how much they had encouraged him. He praised the church as a model church. Yet, even good churches have their problems, difficulties, and they need clarification on things. And that's the case of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 deals with the problem of suffering. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 deals with the problem of eschatology, and we're going to talk about that, eschatology, the coming of the Lord, and uh, the, 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 uh, the matters concerning end times, and uh, I, I want to share with you right now that uh, what we talk about the next three weeks in chapter two are going to seem like you're reading the newspaper. So uh, it's very important that you uh, attend next week, be here if you can, be here online if not in person, and uh, you might want to invite somebody to hear that. And then uh, the last uh, part was he's going to talk about in chapter 3 is the problem of idleness. Now, we know the author, Paul. He is the main writer. He says so in the last couple of verses of the book. But he had some helpers, and he always recognized his helpers. He never ran a solo ministry. He always had somebody with him. Silvanus is his Roman name. Silas, we know him as his Hebrew name. And Timothy. Timothy was really somebody, to be honest, because he was from Lystra, and Lystra is the place where Paul was stoned, left for dead. And yet, even left for dead, bleeding and bruised, he came into the city and recruited Timothy, and Timothy (laughs) decided to go with him in spite of the danger of associating with that guy. And boy, what a a man. I love Timothy, one of my favorite people in all of the Scriptures. So we have Paul, Silas, and Timothy. I want us to stand and read, as is our custom, these verses in the first chapter of the book of 2 Thessalonians. The words are on the screen, and let's begin reading together right now. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure." which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Father, once again, add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word. Draw that one that doesn't know you to yourself today and help every believer have great confidence in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. We've begun to print the handout sheets once again, and we've added a feature. Uh, it will encourage you concerning what goes on in community groups because a lecture guide or a, a lesson guide is also included so you can see what kind of things might be discussed at the group during discussion time. I want to jump right into this this morning. Paul noted some things here, and I want to note them with you. He noted the blessing of this place uh, the blessing of this place where they were. Paul couldn't just say hello when he began a letter, and he couldn't just say farewell when he finished the letter. Everything, everything was weighty, and everything was full of Bible doctrine. And so what did he say about the place? Well, the believers were in a safe place. They were living in a place of assurance. You say, well, do you, does, are you talking about the city of Thessalonica? No. Uh, Thessalonica was just a place in the north of Macedonia. It was on the Ignatian Way, the main road going across the north of Macedonia. Many troops had walked through there. Now, I'm referring to what Paul was referring to because in that verse he says that uh, he writes to the church of Thessalonica, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Oh, there's just so much security. There's so much hope in knowing that you're in Christ Jesus. Folks, we memorized it, Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation to those that are in Des Moines. Amen? Amen. No. There's no condemnation to those that are sitting in Grace Church, right? No. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That is so very important. Once we believe on Him, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the worldwide body of Christ. And for those that were in the city of Thessalonica, listen folks, you could be in Grace Church, but not in Christ Jesus. You can be at this location, but still be lost. Going to church is not going to guarantee anything for anybody, but being in Christ Jesus is a sure foundation that will never go away. So being in Christ by faith. So the believers were also enjoying sustaining grace. Look at verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He always says it, grace and peace. Uh, it is so beautiful the way he says it. Now folks, he says grace and peace and we have to re recognize the order and recognize what he says because he says grace and peace is from God our Father. Now I just want to put it this way, the only way to know peace is is to know grace first. You either know grace and therefore know peace, or you have no grace and you have no peace. And so the point is, is that the way to have peace, and folks, in the world that we're living in, if you want to you get off the roller coaster and off the up and downs of what's going on in our society, then you need to run into the tower of Jesus Christ. Run into His tower, into His refuge, and be safe. Just always, always run to God in the times of trouble because he is a, He's a shelter in the time of storm. He is our high tower and hiding place. He is a rock where we can stand above the fray. He is our hiding place and we know it because of the grace that is in Jesus Christ. It's interesting the way he says it. He says that well, grace to you and peace from our from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Emphasis on the word our. A lot of people live their Christian life like me and Jesus got a good thing going. But everything in the scriptures is plural. Our. He is our God and he's our Father which puts us in a group of people of more than one. He's not just my Savior, He's our Savior. He's not just my God, He's our God. So what are you emphasizing? I'm emphasizing this, that we are siblings with others. We are part of a family. Because we believe in Jesus, then we're part of a bigger group. Some of them I've never met and I'll never know them until I get to heaven because I don't speak their language and they live somewhere else in the world. But many that I do know that I rub shoulders with all of the time right here in this room, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, and because we are, we have a family to love and a family to serve and a family to uphold in prayer and to serve together with. And so I just want to pull over and say at some point, 
at some point. I appreciate the, what Michael has done and his team with Marty and others and those that are working on that team to make online uh, uh, live streaming and availability to all of us. It's, it's a wonderful blessing. When on a trip, when sick, when you're feeling the effects of COVID or when you're in that category of people that it's very dangerous to be in and among people because of your physical state, then wonderful. Online is great. But at some point, it is very important for us to know and to remember that the church of Jesus Christ gathers. And it gathers continually and it gathers together. And why do I say that? Because the one another's of Scripture and the encouraging, the mutuality of Christianity is based upon knowing one another, talking to one another, praying for one another, interacting with one another, and caring for one another. So folks, let's don't get used to just, well, this is great, but I can just always watch it online. Wonderful. Use it while it's necessary. But at some point, the gathering, and I don't know about you, those of us that were in the room today, we had a nice time. I'm here to tell you, it's already a good time in Jesus. So, Paul noted some reasons for his praise and his pride. He noted some reasons. And here are the reasons. God had begun a good work in them. He says this many times, Philippians 1, 6. He says, God is, um, has begun a good work in those Philippians. He says it here to the, to the Thessalonians. He said back in chapter 1 of this book that there was evidence of their election. We read it in chapter 1, verse three and following, we, that they had a faith that was a working faith. Because they were believers, they were active with their faith. And then they had love that labored. It wasn't just a warm, fuzzy hug of the neck. It was love that labored. It's love that when it saw a need, it filled it. It was love that when it saw somebody who was discouraged, they sought to encourage them. It was a love that did something. You know, love is supposed to be something that is indeed in truth. First John three eighteen. let us not love in word or tongue but in deed and in truth. And then they also had something else. They had hope that was patience. Now this is 1 Thessalonians, 1 chapter, verse 3. They had hope that was patience patient. Their hope was the kind of hope that when it got difficult and there used to be tribulations and persecutions, then they did not let their circumstances dictate their faithfulness. They just kept on serving the Lord. Faith, love, hope, faith, hope, and love. That's that beautiful trio of Christian graces that's always to be there. Now, they witnessed as well, chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. They, were, they made the gospel known throughout all of Macedonia and the surrounding areas. And Paul loved them so much. He said, man, you guys are doing such a good job of outreach. I don't even need to add anything to it. Now, we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and we find out God was still doing a good work in them, only greater. That's awesome. I got to say this. I praise the Lord that God is going to do greater works in us, I believe, COVID-19 or not, I believe God is good. He has greater works in store for us. You say, Pastor, don't you think C-19 has done a devastating thing? Well, in some ways it has, but in other ways it's purified us. In other ways, it has is, it is really sort of made us declare where we really stand and what we really believe. And I believe the truth is this. I believe better days are ahead of us and God's going to give us many opportunities. In chapter 1 of the second book, he said this. Look at verse 3. He said, we are bound to thank God always for you. He said, I've just got to give thanks. He says, the word, he says, it's fitting. It's right. I've just got to do it. They weren't perfect, but their spiritual life was simply a wonderful blessing to him. Boy, I can say that about our church. This has been a scary, unpredictable, unnerving, unsettling, irritating, and a blessed year, 2020. You say, wait, 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 wait. That last statement, why, why did you say that? Because all the other, well, because it has been a tremendous blessing. Your desire to get back to church, your eagerness to give. I just wrote a letter and sent it out to the whole church and put the giving records in it. And in it, I, I was just blown away at this year, 2020, being a year with all of the problems and all the difficulties and all the things that were going on, a year at which Grace Church gave more than it did the year before. That's an astounding truth that I'm sharing with you right there. And so you're desire to give and to get back to church, your words of encouragement and your spiritual hunger have been a blessing and a motivation to me. The constant emails and texts and people stopping me in the hall and saying, Pastor Phil, we're glad that you just keep on keeping on. So just keep on keeping on. Just keep doing it. Man, 
It's so encouraging. He says that about these people. He says their faith was growing in verse number three and four. That, that's what he had recognized in them at the first, and it's still growing. He says their love is abounding. He had recognized that at the first, and it still continues. Now, he said, this is wonderful how your faith and your love are growing uh, to, and your love toward one another, but let me pray about it. He says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love one to another, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's praying for them. He so it said back in chapter one, man, you guys, are, you guys are got faith, hope, and love, and your faith is growing, and your love is abounding, and praise the Lord. So let me pray for you. Lord, help their faith to grow even more and help their love to just keep on growing and even abounding more and more. So we get to chapter, we get to this chapter and we find out in verses three and four that his prayers were answered. You know, I like to get my prayers answered, don't you? I like to pray about things that really gets God's attention. And Paul said, I prayed for it. And now it's evident your faith is strong and it's growing and you do love each other more and more. Their hope was persevering. They had persecutions. Yes, they had been warned about it in chapter two, verse 14 of the first book. Now it's come to pass. I just got to say this. He's thanking God for these people. He's thanking God for what they're doing. And it's enough to make a minister proud when he sees his people full of faith and growing Third John chapter three, or Third John one, which only has one chapter, verses three and four, talk about what it is when he sees he sees his children, those that he was leading. He sees them walking in the faith. Well, you see, God in this book he points out in verse number five was doing a kingdom work in them. Sometimes we talk like that. We say, you know, we're not just serving, not just serving this local community. We're not just serving ourselves. We're not just serving the people in our purview. But we're doing a kingdom work here. They were not self-centered Christians, Paul said, continually seeking God's relief from suffering and problems. Uh, they, were, they did not make comfort, convenience, and well-being the only goals of their Christian faith. They understood that suffering served a purpose and that perseverance in suffering would produce patience. Let me just give this statement to you this morning. God is always working for us. And he is always working in us. A lot of us love the for us part. God, please do this and do that and fix this and fix that and give me this and give me that and heal me from this and heal me from that and help this one and help that one and correct this one. And fix. Just we're praying for God to work. But the truth is, is God's working for us all the time and he is working in us all the time. You say, well, how does he work in us? Well, a lot of times when he's working in us, it has to do with the trouble. The pain, the persecution, because you see, he's very interested in your endurance and your strength and your spiritual fortitude. He is very interested in you knowing how to stand up in the wind. So he stands, puts a little wind in your life so you can stand up in it. And he puts a little trouble in your life so you know what to do with it. You see, God knows that his patience and endurance is a goal that he has for us. And the best way to get it is not by giving us a smooth ride with, padded, with a padded lifestyle from here to eternity. No, no, he, he's doing something else. He's working for us. He's working in us. And I just want to say something to you. Folks, we're part of something bigger than our own little world. We are part of something bigger than our own little church and our own little program and our own little ideas and systems. God is doing something far greater than what we are. A part. We're a part of it, and it's a lot bigger than we are, and God is doing something through suffering, and that's something that he is doing. He's doing it because there is something and there is someone worth living for. There is someone worth dying for. There is someone to whom giving it all is not enough. There's someone to whom we can say, I make my life a living sacrifice because you're worthy of it. And his name is Jesus. It's so important. I can picture it now as you can. The sights during the so-called Arab Spring a few years back of those blindfolded believers in Li Egypt, Libya, and Sudan as they made them kneel on those beaches and they had them blindfolded and they asked them to recant their Christian faith and they would not recant and they put a gun to their head and they shot them in the back of the head. I can still see it. It broke my heart, but it strengthened my resolve. 
It's time for us to not give in. Listen, folks, this isn't time for Christians to just get weak need and, and, and closed mouth. This isn't time for us in our nation. If there was ever a time that it's extremely dark, this is it. And if there was ever a time that our light is bright, it's now. It's time for us to stand up, to say something, to do something, to help somebody, to reach. Out. It is not time to cower. It's not time to hide. It's not time to be afraid. It's time to be bold and Jesus. It's time to step forward and say something to somebody about Jesus. Oh, it's so important. God made some promises to these people. I've got to look at this passage here, verse number 6 to 10. He says there in verse 6, he says, it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. God made some promises to them, thus he makes promises to us. He made promises to them concerning wrath and concerning rest. Now, folks, I don't chase any subject in the Bible, but I don't dodge any subject when it comes up. And here it is. It is so amazing. Notice verse 5. He talks about the righteous judgment of God. Look at verse 6. It's a righteous thing for God to repay people for the persecution of his servants. And friends, you can be sure that God judges righteously, rightfully, and truthfully every single time. Genesis 18, 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And, and when I mention the wrath of God, and even maybe perhaps those watching online, and perhaps those that are sitting in this room, I mentioned the wrath of God. Some people get nervous, immediately object, saying, well, I, my God is a God of love, and he, he can have no wrath. I say to you, how preposterous can you be? A cursory reading of the Word of God mentions His love and His wrath, sometimes in the same verse. God is a God of wrath. It is so important that we understand this. Folks, you cannot love what is intrinsically good without despising what is evil. You cannot love those things that God calls blessed without hating those things that God calls cursed. And I'm telling you this morning that our God, he knows how to differentiate between what is good and evil and who is good and evil. Wrath. It's so incredibly important. Verse 6, wrath is God's prerogative. It is not ours. We are not to exercise wrath. We think sometimes we like to take over God's job and we like to just exercise a little wrath of our own. If nothing else, the wrath of our words. Be careful, folks. I said it last week. I'll say it again. You do not work the righteousness of God on Facebook when you let somebody have it. We are... We are desensitized to what it is because of Facebook, because of Twitter, because of all of these things. We're saying anything comes to mind. That is not okay, Christian. The Bible says very clearly, Romans 12, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. You say, well, God's a God of vengeance. Well, if you, if you, if you uh, uh, think that God is a God of vengeance because he's a get even God. No, no, no. God's vengeance is it just simply carrying out his justice. Hebrews 10, 30, it says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then we cannot get it right. It's so important for you to understand. Well, I, you know, I just like to let people know what I think and just, you know, just tell them what I think. Or maybe I'd like to even take some action. And well, listen, we can't get it right. We can, we never know how to measure it right. We never know how to do it right. We don't have all the information. God has every detail. He has every note. He has every every jot and tittle of everything. He has the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs and the goods and the bad. He has every note on every people because you see Jesus is the faithful witness, Revelation chapter 2. He knows everything. And so when God judges his just, his judgment is according to what is right and according to the facts. When we judge, we never have all the facts. 
So then, beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Did you hear that phrase? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, whether it's verbal wrath or physical wrath or any other kind of wrath. Wrath is God's prerogatives. And then we come to this section, verse 6 through 8. There are specific objects of wrath. God is going to trouble those who trouble you. In other words, he's going to afflict those that have been afflicted. Now, I just want to say to you that there's payday someday coming, folks. There's a divine payday on the way. And he is going to repay those that have persecuted his children and have herded them like cattle. And that hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, there's a payday coming. And there's payday coming for those that got shot in the back of the head on the sands of Libya. And there's payday coming for the Christians around the world at every level of persecution. God will avenge himself on those that do not know him. Let's look at the scriptures here. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, well, that is really amazing. You know, what do you mean in flaming fire? I mean, you think, listen, folks. You can, if you take your Zacto knife to the Bible and start chopping things out before long, you won't have the Word of God. He's going to take vengeance on those that do not know God. You say, well, the poor souls around the world that do not know Him, that don't have any information. Listen, this is not about a lack of information. This is about, a, a, this is about rejecting the information that you do have. This is about knowing, and it goes all the way back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following. It's so very clear. You know, in their mind, they knew about God, but they decided that they would reject God. They didn't want to take knowledge of Him, and they decided to put Him aside and worship something else. You see, everybody is hardwired for worship. You're either going to worship the one true God or a God of your own making. You're going to worship the one true God, or you're going to worship a God that you see with your eyes, like the sun, the moon, the stars, an animal, or some system, or some person, or some relationship. You're going to worship. Everybody worships, but they didn't want to worship God, and they didn't want to say thank you to Him. And so they rejected the God of the universe, and the Bible is so very, very clear because the Bible says that the, that the power, the, the might, the Godhead, and His eternal power are evident from the creation of the world, so they are without excuse. It's not about a lack of information. It's about rejection of the one true God. The Bible says so very, very clearly that to reject the almighty God, Elohim, is damnable to our souls. They didn't want to know him. John 17, 3 could not be clearer. This is eternal life. You want eternal life? This is it. That they may know you, speaking of the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's about a relationship. Do you know him? And are you known by him? This is so very important. Do you know him? Do you know him in the sense of faith and trust? God will avenge himself on those that do not know him. He will avenge himself on those that do not o obey the gospel. You say, Pastor, that's a very interesting construct in the scripture. What do you mean, obey the gospel? I thought we just believed and were saved. I didn't write the Bible, but let me see if I can't cast some light on this. Pastor, I thought we believed the gospel. It sounds like a work. How do you obey the gospel? Listen to the scriptures, Mark 1, 14 to 15. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he said to them, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, get, to this, get this now, repent and believe the gospel. The Pharisees and the Jews that were all upset in John chapter 6 and asked him a question. And so they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Hey, God, or, or hey, uh, uh, Jesus, we want to work the works of God. What do we do? What's the list? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him in whom he has sent. 1 John 3, 23 what about, is there some commandment to keep, some work to do? This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Obey the gospel. But you see, there are many, many people who have rejected the idea of the gospel, rejected the idea that sin is a separator, rejected the idea that sin puts us outside of the family of God, outside of the, of the realm of his kingdom. They reject that idea. And even if it is true, then I'll work my way to heaven. There is no work for you to accomplish. It's all been done. Remember, two religions, the religion of do and the religion of done. It is finished. Jesus did it. We must believe. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, the Bible says. Oh, it's so important. There's a specific nature to this wrath, verse 8 and 9. The mighty angels will administer the wrath. There's no wiggling out of their reach. Matthew 13, 41, the Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all that offend and those who practice lawlessness, get this, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. All your life you've heard people talk about heaven for climate and hell for company. They haven't read this verse. He speaks in this passage, verse 8, about flaming fire. He says, well, I just don't know if I accept that. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and following says that when their names are not found written in the book of life, that they are picked up body and soul and cast into the lake of fire where the devil and the false prophet are and they will burn there forever. Everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, 41. He will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Listen to this phrase. This is the essence of hell, the essence of separation from God. It's these words, banned from his presence. Banned. Out of here with you. This is the essence. Listen to Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many, many wonders in your name? Listen to what he says. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. I cannot imagine words more devastating than to be standing before the God of eternity, standing there before the throne and hear him say, depart Away with you, out of my presence, forever. There, are, there could be no more devastating words. Even the vilest sinner on planet earth is enjoying the presence of God in this universe, the power of God and the provision of God. But at some point, the rejection is final. And he says, because you have rejected me on earth, I reject you in eternity. And he says, depart from me. It's not playtime when we stand before God. It's not Jesus is my big buddy in heaven anymore. Depart from me. There's no more devastating statement that could ever be made. Without God's glorious power, we are powerless to relieve the suffering. Without God to do it for you, we are lost. Rest, relief, rewards are also promised. Oh boy, this is the shoe on the other foot, praise the Lord. There's rest and there's relief and there's rewards that are promised to us as children. You see, there's a divine payday someday. God will do it in his time. He's going to do it when he's revealed at his parousia. He's coming, his unveiling, his appearing, his revelation. Here's what he says in Revelation 22:12. 12. I love this. Behold, I am coming quickly or suddenly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm coming. I'm coming very quick. And when I do, I've got my reward with me. You know, our culture has just, we have mocked the God of heaven, mocked the word of God, and we have substituted cultural icons. We have made, we have taken, and we have made uh, Santa Claus and all of his gifts. We have pl replaced him there in the place of Jesus coming with rewards for all of his saints. Have you been faithful in serving God? Have you been faithful in loving Him? Have you been faithful? You say, well, I just, you know, I just never seem to have any success. I try to share Christ with people. Listen, folks, God is not rewarding us because of our success rate. God is rewarding us because of our faithfulness to Him. Ah, it's required of us that we be found faithful. God's going to do it in His time. God's going to do it for His glory. God's going to do it for our glory, and He's going to be glorified in us. Oh, what a beautiful thought. How is God going to take me and look at me and glorify himself in eternity in me? God's going to do it to the amazement of the world. It says that they're going to be admired. It, 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 the whole thing is going to be admired. Rest, relief, rewards, rejoicing. It's all ours, folks, but we must wait. You see, this is not payday today. This is payday someday. This is God's divine payday. And so whether it's on the side of wrath or whether it's on the side of reward, God is keeping the records. God has set the timing and there's payday in the future. But what we're supposed to do, no matter what the circumstances, is serve God with our whole heart. 
Paul prayed for them effectually. He, I'm just going to just go through these quickly. He prayed for them to be worthy. Their testimony mattered. He prayed for them to walk according to his power, to walk worthy. And then he prayed for their witness to be powerful, to witness faithfully. I have to close. I can't close without asking this question. Do you know Jesus? Have you obeyed the gospel? There is no dickering with God on his gospel message. You either receive it or reject it. And the law of sowing and reaping comes into play here because what we sow, we're going to reap. And if we've sowed faith, we're going to reap an eternity in his presence. And if we've rejected him, maybe you're online out there and you're listening and maybe you don't even go to this church, but you're thinking, man, what happened to that guy? Well, I came to a passage of scripture that I cannot jump and I can't soft pedal. And I'm just here to tell you this morning that there's a God in heaven who has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for us because we're sinners and he offers us forgiveness and eternal life and to reject that is a bad thing. To receive it <laughs> grants us forgiveness and eternal life and part in his family and an inheritance that doesn't fade away that's reserved in heaven for us and a partnership with Jesus and everything that comes to Jesus comes to us. Why will we reject it? I wonder as I close this morning is there anybody out there and online that's listening and what I've said something perhaps about the rewards perhaps about the wrath it's really touched you and, and maybe you've got decisions to make well make them and maybe you're out there and you need to trust Jesus you need to call on him well do it before it's too late and if you're in the room this morning I just want to say to you now is the accepted time not some other day now is when we say yes to Jesus. The Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Of course, it's a call of faith, a call of belief, a call of trust. But have you?